Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start in a few seconds. Um, just give everyone the opportunity to join. The numbers are climbing up still quite fast. All right, I would say I'll give it a start. Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to today's EPC election monitor, where we'll discuss um, the German elections, the results of the German federal elections, the next steps, and the possible implications. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Johannes Greubel. I'm a policy analyst at the European Policy Center, and I'll have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. And um, we have a lot to discuss. I mean, uh, Germany has elected its first post Merkel Bundestag last Sunday um, with a turnout of, of uh, nearly 77%. And after a very successful past few uh, campaign weeks, the SPD and the Olaf Scholz won the biggest vote share with 25.7%, gaining about 5% compared to the federal elections in 2017. And um, they will become the biggest party of the new um, Bundestag. The SPD came in 1.6%, uh, about 10 seats ahead of the CDU CSU, uh, which lost um, nearly 9% points compared to 2017 and had to face the worst election result in its history with around 24%. The Greens came in third with about 15%, um, considerably increasing its vote share, but um, ranking lower than polled previously. And the Greens are followed by the Liberal FDP with 11.5% and the AFD with about 10%. Um, and finally, the left party drop below the 5% and only uh, will be represented in the Bundestag because they won three municipality mandates. Thus, um, things are complicated at the moment, um, as it will most likely take three parties to form a coalition. But um, we want to discuss now what are the implications of this result, um, what are the next steps um, were the polls right? Um, are there any surprises? Um, what do the results tell us about the public and the political mood in the country? And what are the implications for the EU and also for other member states? Um, but of course, we don't want to discuss just among ourselves. Um, you can come in at any point. Um, so if any questions arise during the event, please feel free to ask your question throughout the whole discussion. And I will try to weave them um, into the debate. So if you would like to come in, you can do so in two ways, um, either by sending a question via the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. If you do so, I would just like to ask you uh, to uh, keep your question short. Uh, please, no essays um, at about tweet length would be great. Um, or you can also come in directly um, with your question or a contribution um, by raising your virtual hand button also on the bottom of your screen, and then I will give you the floor. But um, let's get right into our topic. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce the three speakers for today's event. Um, first of all, we have uh, Kerstin Gamelin, um, who is a deputy ed uh, editor-in-chief of the Berlin office of the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung. Uh, before that, she was also a Brussels correspondent of Süddeutsche Zeitung. So we're very happy to have you today and I look forward um, to your insights on the domestic angle, but also the European angle directly uh, from Berlin. Thanks for being here. Um, Thanks for invitation. And uh, we also have um, Sophie Ponschlegel, of course, uh, who is senior policy analyst and project leader of the EPC's Connecting Europe program. And of course, uh, Yannis Emanuelides, who is the EPC's director of studies. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, there's more than enough to discuss. So we'll just uh, jump in uh, straight into the debate. And I'll like to uh, direct my first question to Ms. Gamelin. Uh, Ms. Gamelin, uh, the, dust has, the dust has settled a bit. Um, we know now the results. Uh, the parties had uh, first board meetings yesterday and uh, the CDU CSU will come together for a first uh, group meeting um, uh, today. Um, so time to, uh, to assess the results. What are your main takeaways from uh, this election outcome? Yeah. Who are winners, losers? Uh, what are surprises? 
Yeah, I mean, um, now we know the figures, but uh, in Berlin, uh, many people do not realize yet what really happened. I mean, they are still trying to manage um, the reality, which means uh, the CDU lost or the CDU CSU lost the chancellery. And uh, last night there, were, or there was a big uh, garden meeting um, of the SPD and many new people were there and everybody said, oh, you know, I cannot believe. <clears throat> so they are still trying to manage uh, uh, to realize what happened. Um, the really surprise was yesterday that uh, or on Sunday that the SPD really managed to get a majority. Nobody expected it for a long time. And uh, I would like to remember a year ago or <clears throat> let's say three months ago, nobody believed that the SPD could really uh, rock this election. Um, we know that Olaf Scholz and his, um, his team had this a long plan a long time before that they would like to try, uh, that he would like to try to run as a chancellor candidate and then to try to get the chancellery, but nobody believed in that. It really seemed like science fiction. <clears throat> so, and now this science fiction became reality and that's the reason why people are still managing to, to get it. Um, and the same is for the CDU, CSU, but the other way around. They thought <clears throat> after 16 years with Angela Merkel in the chancellery, basically they have an abonnement for the chancellery and not, not much to do to stay in there. But as newspapers have to, to uh, fight to get readers, also CDU now realized they, or they realized a few weeks ago, they have to do something. But uh, honestly spoken, it was not enough uh, what they did. Uh, I mean, the candidate was weak. The candidate was not convincing. The candidate did a lot of mistakes, little mistakes, even on the last day, the election day. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know this uh, picture which went viral uh, that he uh, being in this, uh, at the place where he did the election, uh, he, uh, the piece of paper he put into the box was uh, on the wrong side. So you could see uh, uh, which party he had elected. I mean, was not surprised at the party he had elected, but it is against the rules. Um, so, and then the Green, let's come short uh, to the Green Party. I mean, they were very ambitious. They thought they can uh, uh, also run for chancellery the first time in history. They had a councillor candidate, Annalena Baerbock. Um, and when she was uh, uh, announced, there was a huge hype uh, that uh, many people thought now it's the right person for the chancellery, but also very, yeah, very soon they realized um, all these uh, things they thought she could do. She is obviously not able to do so. She lost. And if you compare the result of 15% with the ambitious goal they had uh, to, uh, to win the chancellery, it is also the Green Party is not really a winner. Uh, the Liberal a uh, FDP managed to stay stable. Uh, it's a good result for Christian Lindner. He managed, uh, uh, he managed to, I mean, to benefit from the pandemic in a way that we had a lot of restrictions and many people were really tired of these restrictions and he promised freedom and liberty and, and liberal uh, values. Um, and then we have the AFD which lost uh, in general. Um, uh, so they, are, they managed to stay with 10%, but it's less than they had. And Links Partei, actually we thought it is a party that is in the German system it is established, but as we can see, it is not really established. So that's in a, I will stop here now, and, uh, but that's in a few words, the situation. Thanks for your first assessment. And I think we'll come back to a lot of these points uh, that you already touched upon, including um, how, could, uh, how did we get there? How did we get to this yeah. science fiction result um, for the SPD? Um, Sophia, um, if you would like to react, um, and maybe I can also add, Another question um, or more forward looking question. What are the next steps now? What mm -hmm. is going to happen in the in the days and weeks to come? Yeah, so um, I mean, in, uh, Kerstin Gallimil already showed like the, the kind of uh, landscape we face at the moment. And I think maybe it's a science fiction result, but I wouldn't say that it's a bad one. Also looking at the European Union, 
um, I think generally we had um, not the best campaign. We had a very contentless campaign, which was focusing a lot on the on the figures uh, of the candidates for the chancery. But I think in general, I would say it's it's we knew it was going to be an uncertain result with three parties probably. But generally, I would say that all of them are relatively pro-European. So I would expect them hopefully to be um, reasonable enough to to find a coalition in the in the coming months. When it comes to the next steps, um, what has been interesting is that the Greens and the Liberals will probably talk first. So it's the smaller parties that are the kingmakers, uh, and then they will choose the bigger um, partners. So it's the junior partners that are really having a huge power and lots of leeway to decide about, up, about the next coalition. I think it will also depend on how the, the CDU, so the Conservatives, will position themselves. Um, they have a big party meeting today um, and we'll see. I think they really struggle uh, with the, the results they got because they lost out. And maybe to one point, I think it's also interesting because you can, of course, compare um, the success or the failure of a party compared to the election result of 2017, so the last election, or you can compare it to uh, the polls that they were expecting. And I think there for the Greens, it's quite difficult because compared to 2017, they did really well. Uh, they were at seven, eight percent, I think, and now they're at fi almost 15 percent. So it's it's a pretty you know important uh, success compared to the last election, but compared to the polls that they were expecting, um, which I remember, I think it was last year or the year before, they were even at 27 percent at some point, which was like extremely high. So they were kind of seeing themselves already as almost like a, as a real contender to the conservatives and the social democrats. And in the end, they ended up being uh, not too far from the liberals. So um, I think there it depends really on the kind of interpretation you, you have. And one point also on the social democrats, I think it was fascinating to see um, how it worked with Olaf Scholz. Um, maybe it says something about the Germans and that they like stability and someone who uh, seems to be more of an accountant than a politician. He wasn't very charismatic, but he really was in the way of Merkel, um, you know, playing on the fact that he was already the finance minister, minister that he had the experience um, and that he seemed to be a reasonable candidate um, that, that will have the kind of stability that we're used to with Merkel. Um, and what I think will be interesting to see is how they will, um, what kind of coalition agreement we will see in the coming months. So all of them, all of the parties right after the, um, the talk show, right after the election results on Sunday night, they all said that they wanted really quick results. I mean, to have coalition negotiations that won't be as long as 2017, where we only had a government in place uh, in March 2018, so almost six months later. I hope that this time they all said before Christmas, we want to have um, a coalition agreement in place and therefore a new German government. Um, I think it will very much depend on whether the parties, so the Liberals, the Greens and the Social Democrats, because I think that's the most um, obvious um, coalition that we will get. Um, it will depend really on the parties, whether they can trust themselves. And I think there are some um, policy files where they really will, will find some consensus, but I think there will also be very difficult negotiations um, when it comes to climate change, to taxation, um, to economic and fiscal policy, especially between the Liberals and the Greens, for instance. I think there's more of a policy overlap with the Social Democrats and the Greens if you look at the programs. So we'll see. And I'll already talk too much because there's a lot to say, as you see. <laughs> Um, thank you, Sophie. Yanis, uh, what is your take, um, especially on the new government? Um, uh, Sophie already hinted the central role of the FDP and the Greens um, and hinted that she believes that a traffic light coalition uh, with the SPD is, is most likely um, in her view. Do you agree with her? What are the chances for, for Jamaica um, with the CDU, CSU? Um, uh, is a grand coalition, can, can a grand coalition be ruled out uh, completely? And um, maybe in any case, uh, what can Germany and Europe expect from this new government? Well, first of all, I think that there are four theoretical options, um, but two you can exclude, and then you remain with two other options. The two you can exclude is the grand coalition to which you refer to. I think that if you look at the, the last four years of this of the latest grand coalition, they had already run into exhaustion. You saw how problematic they were. I think on both sides, it's not doable. On the CDU, CSR being the minor partner in the grand coalition, 
wouldn't work. And for the SPD, they have other options which are much more attractive. And the experience of grand collisions in the past from the SPD perspective have not been positive. So you can exclude that option. There are some who have even uh, thought about the idea that you might have some kind of a minority government. If you remember in 2017, 2018, at some point when there were problems in finding a coalition, there was also talk about minority government. I think that's not an option either. In theory, it could be, but it isn't. So the real two options are three-party coalitions, as already been mentioned. Uh, the Jamaica one with the CDU uh, who leading together with the Greens and the FTP, or the traffic light, the SPD, together with the uh, Greens and, and the Liberals. From my perspective, and given the results, uh, I believe that the chances are highest for a traffic light, uh, because as Cassie Gamini was already um, already mentioned, this was a historical defeat for the CDU and CSU. For many reasons, I'm sure we're going to come back to these uh, detailed reasons, but it was a historical defeat for them. So to have a convincing narrative at this point in time, arguing that we, the CDU CSU, should be leading a government and Amin Laschet should become um, the uh, next German chancellor is not a really convincing narrative. They've tried on Sunday to get it across, but it was already difficult. And since yesterday, we're seeing that even within the CDU CSU, there are many who are saying, well, let's, uh, let's take into account that we have lost and we need to make a critical analysis of where we are. And if it comes to Jamaica, okay, but it's not that we have gotten that we have gotten now from citizens uh, the vote to form a new government. So that leaves us with the most likely option, which is the traffic light, um, uh, led by the SPD uh, and by uh, by uh, Scholz becoming uh, the next chancellor. Um, it was already mentioned earlier uh, that this was his victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if if you think back, as Kerstin, you said three six months ago, a year ago, nobody would have expected this. Um, so it was his victory and the loss of, of others. I think there's a combination. And again, I think we're going to come to the details later on. But it was his victory. Um, and people also went in, in, in public uh, polls, which have been conducted. And um, even now over the past days, when people are being asked, who do you wish as be becoming next chancellor? He has the big majority of the German population. So even among the 75% of voters who did not vote for the SPD and thus did not vote for him, and he enjoys a lot of confidence uh, by the people and a lot of support. So this is probably the most likely out outcome. Traffic light with him becoming the next chancellor. Yeah, Ms. Gamelin, you said you agreed with Yanis uh, that this is yes. um, Scholz's victory. Um, maybe let's take this opportunity to, to take a look back of um, what were the main factors that we got here? What what did Scholz do well? What did um, Laschet uh, do, do badly? And uh, maybe uh, to uh, to give the, the question another turn, uh, was Scholz able to present himself as a better choice for continue, continue, continuation of, of Merkel? I mean, yes. I mean, there are two big reasons, I think, uh, for Scholz and his victory. The one is that the others did mistake, and the, uh, the, 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 other is, the other reason is that he himself managed really to establish the SPD, re-establish the SPD, and he did a really good campaign. And first of all, he really started a year ago already um, by saying, so I will be the transfer candidate and my, my goal it is now that people start trusting me again. People should start uh, to, to trust what he is doing and again, trust him and again and again. And in this long run of the year, he, he wanted to, uh, to, gain, to, to get back a huge amount of, okay, what Scholz is doing is not so bad. And that's what he managed. And at the end, he managed also that the, the people said, okay, I, we believed SPD was almost dead, but now look at them, they are a good alternative. And how did he do it? I mean, his campaign, I don't know whether you have seen, you have been in Germany, but the campaign of the SPD, of the Social Democrats, it is really a great campaigning. Uh, it was a great campaigning. You, you know, uh, there was this slogan, Scholz packed us on, so Scholz will do it. So it was a it was different words of, we can do it, I will do it. Uh, yeah, and, um, and many people said, okay, you know, we are in an environment of uh, multiple crises. We have this climate crisis. We had have uh, we have had this um, flood in in the western part of Germany, which was really horrible. And uh, we have Corona still, and um, 
you know, and the economy is not as good as we expected the economy to be. So there are many uncertainties, many crises, and Scholz uh, managed to present himself as somebody that said, okay, you know, I will manage that for you. You can go to bed in the evening and you will up, wake up in the morning and it's still everything okay. Um, and so, and he managed that people trust trusted him in this in this uh, in this way. And um, yeah, and um, I, I mean, I have to repeat, nobody thought, especially from journalists and also the bubble in Berlin, uh, many people thought, okay, what's what is he doing there? But then uh, they are all surprised. And perhaps one more word. I mean, uh, especially in the East, it was a big surprise. The SPD, the Social Democratic Party, is the, is the winner also in the eastern part of Germany. They managed to get uh, most of the votes, and this is really a big surprise. Let me remember. Uh, let, re, uh, let me remind you that uh, the previous election and the pre-previous election, the SPD only got one mandate in the east. Only got one mandate in the east, and now they managed to get uh, I don't know almost all. Uh, besides Saxonia and, and Thüringen, but uh, in the other regions, it is complete red. So this is a huge victory also in the East. Mm -hmm. I uh, want to come back to uh, regional divisions between East and, and, East and West uh, later on. But first, uh, Janis, what do you think? Um, maybe also not only looking at Scholz, what Scholz did right, but also uh, what did Laschet not do right? Well, first of all, I fully agree with what Kess, with Kessin's analysis. Um, they did almost everything right. Um, the early candidacy, the fact that there were no party infights. If you look back into past campaigns yeah. of the SPD in the past, you saw that there had been a lot of party infights on the way to the elections, which had harmed them. This time there was unity um, and it was clearly Schultz who was representing the party, he was the one. He, so there was this huge uh, personalization and the Schultz factor and, <clears throat> and him being felt as being the potential successor of Merkel. So this continuity factor. But if you look to the two others um, and Kassin in her introduction mentioned shortly the weakness of the CDU CSU. They did a lot of mistakes. They had, for example, infights among themselves. Yes. Uh, when Laschet was chosen to become a party leader and even on the day of the elections, there were question marks, is he the right person? Should he be the one who, who would be leading the party with the people who were supporting Mads, probably the most vocal in criticizing him? Um, so that was a problem. He stepped into great uh, foot uh, um, shoes, uh, into Merkel's 16 years of chancellery and, and even longer leading the party. So that was a difficult task. Uh, to be objectively um, in, on when it comes to assessing uh, how uh, Laschet performed, but he committed a lot of mistakes. Um, he did not present himself as the person who was in control. He rather was committing mistakes, which challenged uh, the perception as, he, as to whether he could follow into the footsteps of Angela Merkel, whether he could actually be the CDU successor of her. Um, and I think that uh, was a problem. And that, that then there were also... Um, there was the Munich factor, uh, that the CSU were uh, from Munich and with Zöder leading it, also uh, creating uh, at least question marks. And towards the end, they were trying to hide some of them. But in the, during the campaign, it was clear that also the, the, the support from Zöder, who himself had wanted to become uh, the candidate for the chancellery, uh, was not very strong. So I think that there were multiple problems and mistakes which were committed on the CDU, CSU side. Um, if you look into the Greens, um, well, I think there's one point which Kasten mentioned, and that reminded me also four years ago, there was this huge hype with respect yeah. to Annalena Baerbock. Uh, and four years ago, we had a huge hype with respect to Schulz, Schulz, not Schulz, Schulz, when he came um, as the savior from uh, Brussels to Berlin to save the SPD. And in March uh, and, and April of 2017, there was a hype. Everything, everyone was believing this could be the moment where someone could defeat uh, Merkel and it would be him. And we see where the SPD ended at the time, around 20%. Um, so there was now also this Baerbock hype uh, at a certain moment and everyone was attacking her. Also, 
uh, in, a, in a very harsh way. The attacks on her were very personal also, but it worked. Uh, these attacks did work. And then there were mistakes which she committed and she has accepted. And there were multiple mistakes which she com committed and, and did over the past uh, six to nine months. But there were also some very practical mistakes which the Green Party did. Uh, for example, look at the, the story about uh, Annalena Baerbock's uh, CV. That's something which yeah. would have to be clarified by the party itself. And so these are technical mistakes. Uh, which shouldn't have happened. So the weaknesses of the CDU so and the weakness of the Greens gave that push um, to Scholz and to the SPD. Mm -hmm. um, we now looked mainly at the candidates. Uh, Sophia, um, what about the policy issues that, that drove the campaigns? You, you already mentioned it was a content-less campaign, so it didn't yeah. really play a big role. Um, and uh, maybe I compared this with another question. Um, uh, did the pandemic play a role at all during the campaigns? Um, would we have another result without the campaign? <laughs> yeah, very good question. I mean, I mentioned it quickly before. I think um, there was almost no content during that campaign. And that's why I would also maybe a little bit contradict the fact that the Social Democrats did such a good campaign. They did do a good campaign, but it was so much negative campaigning on others that uh, they didn't say much about what they actually wanted. And I think that might be interesting to look at in the future as well, because if you look at the party program of the Social Democrats, um, it's it's quite progressive and ecologic and much more ambitious, I would say, than the ones before. At the same time, they have a candidate that is much more centrist. So I think it's interesting to see in which direction they, they want to move. Um, just as a reminder as well, um, Olaf Scholz was not the preferred candidate for party leadership. Uh, we still have a co-leadership at the Social Democrats that is um, much more vocal and much more socialistic, I would say. I mean, not in the old sense, but much more in the social democratic, um, yeah, much much more left, I would say, simply than what we know from Schultz. So it might be interesting to see how, I think it's a great thing they managed to unite the party during the campaign, and they really did. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, you don't have any content differences within the party either. So we'll have to see where that goes. Um, when it comes to content during the campaign, I think there were mostly two issues, but I'd be happy to see what uh, Kerstin Gamelin and Yanis uh, add. Um, the first one was obviously the climate crisis with the flood. So it was more focusing on, you know, actual news and following this. Um, with the floods, it was clearly the cri climate crisis, even though I would say that the Greens did not um, fare too well. I mean, they didn't try to instrumentalize it, but then at the same time, uh, it was a campaign. So they didn't do much, I feel. Uh, and then the second part was the Afghanistan crisis, where you had a little bit of discussion around migration as well. Uh, these were like the two big peaks, I would say. Um, otherwise, there was very, very little content discussion. And um, that's why it's also hard, difficult to say at this point in time uh, what the parties really want, especially also looking at EU policy. All you can do is look at the party program, see what's written in there. But it's very hard to see where they will be. I mean, you can imagine where the conflict lines will be. And I think economic and fiscal policy is definitely one. Uh, climate crisis, ecological transformation is another one. Uh, but it's 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 difficult to see exactly where um, where the contention points will be in the details and what will come out um, in the coalition agreement. Uh, that's why it's such an interesting phase um, also to see how the Greens and the Liberals um, will get together. I think they mentioned that, for instance, on digital affairs, um, as I said, they and education, they will um, it will be easier. But on other things, it will be much more complicated. And I'm not sure. Um, yeah, they, they will find um, a consensus there. So we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in on policy issues and we'll deal with them um, in a second, but I wanted to uh, give the chance uh, to uh, Kerstin Gamelin to uh, mm -hmm. to react to what Sophie just said and maybe um, speaking about content, uh, I'll pair it with another question um, of a European policy. Um, I mean, Europe didn't play a role at all um, yeah, in, yeah. in the elections. Uh, why was this the case? Why was the EU not a topic this time? Yeah, uh, I mean, the EU did play a role, especially uh, in negative campaigning from uh, the side of the CDU. They, there were warnings of this uh, great uh, Schulden Union that would come in if Scholz uh, uh, did, will win the, the election. So I was really surprised that Europe uh, did not play a role at all uh, from a content point. Um, a few times it was mentioned, but there was not really a discussion. I think one of the reasons is 
that the Germans are busy with uh, realizing all the other crises with climate flood. Afghanistan was a huge, uh, thank you for mentioning that, what to use. Uh, this was really a huge discussion um, that Germany left all these workers in Afghanistan and managed so badly to, to bring those people that helped the Germans there uh, in, in out of the country. Um, so, and um, there were not really problems towards Europe, but there was not really an interest towards Europe. Um, uh, I would like also to come back on this um, uh, thing with the SPD and uh, the leadership of the SPD versus Scholz. Um, it's totally right, uh, Scholz, they did not want to have Scholz as the party leader, but I think this was a huge uh, luck later on for the campaigning. Because if you look at the SPD uh, election program, this is a combination of, of centrist and left wing uh, uh, um, program. Um, and uh, Scholz as a centrist managed to get connected with this party, uh, with the left wing uh, wishes. And I would say if Scholz had been the, the or would have been the party leader, I think it would have been much more complicated for the SPD party members to stay calm and to support that program. But now we had a program which was written by the left wing of the party and the centrists of Scholz. And that together, I think, uh, that together uh, was the reason that the party at the end was really calm and supporting uh, the program. And one word to FDP and Greens. I think, yes, in digitalization and other subjects uh, regarding liberal values, uh, that, that will not be difficult to bring the both uh, together, but it will be difficult uh, when it it's coming to the balance of markets and uh, state. So how much has the state to do and what should markets do? And also about the financing. So the Green Party wants to have um, a huge investment program, I think 500 billion euros for an additional investments in the next 10 years uh, to tackle the climate crisis and the, uh, the FTP uh, is, uh, doesn't want to do that. They, they are believing in the debt break and they want to stay with the debt break. So I think this is a huge issue to tackle. Janis, um, your thoughts, and maybe also um, on the on the European dimension. What can we expect um, from the the new government, uh, which uh, will be in place um, in terms of European policy? But also, there's a few um, questions on the foreign policy dimension. Um, we have a question um, whether the traffic light coalition would continue the grand coalition's foreign policy. Or are there any changes um, expected? Um, and yeah, how, how would how would a three-party coalition in general um, affect Germany's foreign policy? Yeah, thank you. Um, let me mention a couple of points referring also to what uh, Sophie and Kerstin were saying. I fully agree with uh, Sophie's analysis in terms of what the policy issues were or were not. Um, because, and I think the latter was the more characteristic of, uh, of the campaign. Um, but if you um, look into uh, uh, if you look into the campaign as as it developed over time, the parties were able to manifest where their differences were. It was clear what the Greens stood for and what was high on their agenda. Top, what was their top priority? Obviously, climate change and everything related to them. The FDP was able to get across its liberal message, also this message of. We need to progress and get out of the COVID-19 crisis, as Kasten said. And I think they were able to, to convey that to the electorate. Um, and the SPD, and let's not forget, for a lot of people, if you ask them about what are their main matters of concern, they will tell you social justice, the future of pensions. Um, and that was something where the SPD obviously traditionally is strong. And they're also, they were also strong this time around. So yes, there were not a lot of policy issues or policy debate in depth. But at the same time, the parties were able to identify themselves with the key policy issues and concerns which people or the electorate had. Uh, with respect to, um, uh, to the SPD, the internal dis uh, discussion and debate, I think Kasten is perfectly right uh, when she says that, you, that it might have or probably was uh, an added value for him, for Schultz, not being the party leader. The question is now what happens once he gets into the chancellery? Yeah. How will that develop? 
If you look back, um, that goes way back for those who remember when Schröder came to power, he was the candidate, he became chancellor and Lafontaine was the party leader. And they had a, a very difficult time in the beginning of the coalition government. And at the end, the one who prevailed was Schröder because he was the one who actually won the elections for them to a large extent at the time. This time again, you have, you will, if you have a Schultz as, as chancellor, which seems to be our working assumption here, um, he, he, the fact that they won and that they were able to move into the chancellor has a lot to do with him personally. I think that will make him have a very strong position um, also within the party, but, there will, it will become more difficult as time progresses. So we'll see how things will develop over the upcoming years. Uh, but now I think he has a strong advantage also within the party. Um, with respect to Europe, uh, yes, it was not a major concern, uh, at least not in positive constructive ways, uh, but rather uh, along the lines of what Kirsten was saying of negative campaigning. If you vote the SPD, you will move into a debt union, a Schulden union. Um, but here, I think the fact that um, Schultz is a centrist uh, mm -hmm. and that people do not believe that he is someone and he was finance minister uh, and up to a long time uh, and for a long time when being finance, but he was defending also the black zero. Um, he was not someone who was saying we can do, do, do debt spending. When COVID-19 came, the story changed, but there was a strong logic to, um, uh, to, to do what was done in terms of increasing the, the, the debt levels in Germany. Uh, so nobody, uh, was arguing, well, with Scholz, you will probably actually move into the direction of, of, of a debt union. He is a centrist. Um, and I think, again, if you compare it to uh, when, uh, the, when Schröder came to power, that seems to be uh, the magic of success for the SPD. If you have a candidate who is more of a centrist, more towards the center, while still being able to convey the message that he's a social democrat, which Scholz was able to do, that seems to be the, uh, the success formula for the SPD. And so they probably should remember that also with respect to the future. But with respect to the European dimension, I think the bigger picture is that um, we can expect that there will be more continuity than disruption. Uh, if you look ahead into the French elections next year, and there are some who fear that potentially Le Pen might become president, that would be a major disruption. Now, the outcome of this election, and we knew that already before Sunday, would not lead to a major disruption. So, so there's more continuity. However, having said that, with respect to certain aspects, there will be also marked differences with this new uh, coalition government if it is the traffic light. When it comes to uh, green policies, when it comes to the Green Deal, when it comes to climate change, you will still uh, see a strong mark from the Greens, but also the fact that this was a strong issue in the campaigns of also other parties who be part of that coalition, the green issue will be high on the agenda. Uh, when it comes to um, foreign policy, I think what is interesting, and if you um, uh, watch some of the campaigns and discussions here, the FDP and the Greens um, have a stronger position when it comes uh, to, to policy vis-a-vis -vis China which will be very interesting to see how that will develop in this new coalition. Um, and another issue is uh, questions related to Eurozone reform. Here, the liberals will probably stop yeah. ambitious reforms when it comes to Eurozone um, reforms and that they will also claim this for themselves, um, including the finance ministry. So you have some issues where there are, will be marked differences to previous governments, but there will also be a lot of continuity. I'll, I'll come back to the policy issue in a, in a second um, on more general terms, um, maybe uh, to Sophia and then also uh, Kerstin, as you already have um, Paris in your background. Um, what does the results mean uh, for the relations with other member states and, and Paris? And how could, um, I, I have a question here from uh, Christophe Leclerc, who uh, um, asks about impact of other member states, maybe even in the coalition talks. Um, for example, he mentioned um, the role of, of France um, in, in uh, the coalition talks with, with FDP. Um, could, could France help to dilute the FDP's views on tight budget, for example, or could it even be counterproductive? Sophie, maybe first. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I don't think there is much interference of other countries within uh, coalition negotiations. Um, I think at this point in time, Germany is very focused on itself, inward looking, maybe some could say navel gazing, but I think it's a normal period also after the election to first, uh, you know, try to sort out your own cards and make sure that you have a working government at the end. 
So it's about building trust between the parties that will uh, lead the coalition negotiations together. Um, when it comes to the to the Franco-German relationship, I think, um, and I think Macron has made it very clear that they hope to have a German government pretty quickly. So it's more about the timeline than the content. Um, I mean, it's interesting to know that Macron's party and the liberals are both within U Renew Europe, but they have a very different opinion when it comes to economic and fiscal policies. And I don't see that changing uh, anytime soon. I think there is a bigger chance of um, FDP having to water down a little bit their positionings um, because of the Greens and the Social Democrats. Um, but as it is really one of their key messages, as Janis mentioned before, they were very strong at giving the messages out. Um, as this is one of the key positions of the, of the Liberals, I wouldn't even be too optimistic that they will really water down some of these propositions. Um, because really the thing with the market and the states, uh, the Liberals are Liberals and they do not want to get into a debt union um, at any cost in the European Union. So I think that's really going to be one of the contentious points, I would say. Um, maybe to come back to the EU policy, um, just to mention pretty quickly, I think there were really three policy areas that I could see in Germany being um, more important when it comes to the EU. That was migration that was mentioned with the Afghanistan crisis, but it's really a big topic in Germany. The other one is economic and fiscal policy with the Eurozone reform, and the third one is foreign policy. Um, when it comes to foreign policy, maybe just to add to what Janis said about China, um, also I think it's really interesting if you look at the party programs that a lot of the parties mention the EU army. And I think that really shows that within Germany, you have a very vague discussion about some EU policy issues that do not reflect the reality in Brussels. So it's it's more about a feeling that you know nationalism is bad and we are really, really pro-European. But when it comes to the concrete steps to really create a defense union, for instance, it's, uh, yeah, it, the parties do not really have any kind of propositions ready or it will be very difficult to move forward. So I think um, that's why I'm so um, curious to see what will be written on EU policy in the coalition agreement. And maybe one last point there, I really hope that it will be more than the four pages that we saw in 2017 uh, with the Grand Coalition. I mean, it was a very, you know, complex uh, coalition negotiations four years ago uh, with the FDP that got out and then uh, the Grand Coalition had to happen. Um, so they didn't have much time, but I hope that this time, maybe if they are a bit more organized, let's say, that they will have a bit more time to discuss EU policy as well and um, have something more than four pages. Uh, if I may add, I mean, the, the previous coalition treaty had uh, Europe at the first chapter. I mean, yes, that, that, I mean that was a big yes. uh, point. But the question is what uh, happened afterwards. Uh, so that uh, that's more or less the point. Um, yeah, I think there's no doubt that the next government, whatever it will be, is a pro, also a pro-European government. Um, no doubt about that. Also Laschet, I don't expect him to become chancellor, but also Laschet, I think, would stand for that. I mean, uh, regarding the Franco-German relationship, I was uh, happy uh, enough to um, fly with Scholz, I think, four weeks ago to visit Macron. And uh, I had the... Uh, uh, as my, what I, from what I saw, uh, I think it was a very, a very good uh, talk there. And um, Scholz and Macron, they know each other from previous times uh, in Hamburg, when Scholz was mayor in Hamburg. Uh, Macron was there to visit him and his staff as, as a minister for economy, as a French minister for economy. And they, so they know each other, they have uh, Good relationships and I think they improved the relationship um, especially Scholz and Macron uh, last year when they came out with the recovery fund with the EU uh, recovery fund and this was a huge uh, change in paradigm in uh, German politics also that they agreed to have this fund uh, to have a debt for the for the European Union and um, to transfer all that money in the member states so I think this was the proof that they can work together also in a very pro-European uh, manner. Um, I would say um, if there were only the Greens and the SPD, it would be a really uh, pro-European uh, government, but the, the FDP, the Liberal Party will have a role as a yeah, kind of a soldier that is uh, defending stability. Uh, in, in, so in the, in the German way, I would say. And um, I think it will be very difficult to get 
all the three parties uh, at one line uh, regarding this, for instance, fiscal policy. Because uh, as you remember already during the Greek crisis, there were a few members of the FDP voting against uh, this credit program for Greece and they were warning um, uh, against the debt union and um, and the and another big issue we did not mention so far is the policy of the European Central Bank. So also the FDP uh, is could not uh, they did not hesitate to warn against the, the this policy and I think that was uh, actually this is a big danger. Uh, towards the independence of the European uh, Central Bank that during the election campaigning, not only the FDP, but also the CDU, CSU was uh, giving advice what they uh, have to do. I think that, that is where we have to have an eye on it, um, the, the European Central Bank. And then I agree uh, the big issues are migration, um, foreign policy, and also here, I see a, a, a good relationship between uh, Schultz and Macron so far, um, because they have this huge word sovereignty for Europe and uh, also for a European army. I think there will be discussions uh, if Schultz is becoming chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Yanis, uh, your reaction. And um, I, I can see that there is um, apparently the consensus that there will be a pro-European uh, government, no matter what, and also uh, Christophe Leclerc said that in the comments uh, that also in the final round, in the final debate round, you heard an amazing consensus of mainstream parties on EU sovereignty and strategic autonomy and uh, pro-European topics. Um, Yanis, uh, your, your thought on that, and maybe I can uh, pair that because that uh, there are a few questions uh, especially from uh, Olaf Överbe, um on uh, the Green Deal and uh, how will climate policy affect the chances of forming uh, a traffic light coalition and um, will this traffic light coalition give, um, what, what priority will that government give to the Green Deal? Um, will Germany take a leading role there? Yes, let me mention a couple of points, two shorter one and the, than the longer one, and also dealing with the Green Deal. Uh, with respect to the um, to the role of external actors in influencing coalition talks in Berlin, I think Sophie's right. Uh, the ability to affect that will be rather will be, will be very low, um, also because it will be in itself very difficult uh, to figure out how they will agree on a coalition agreement. Now, uh, this will be a very complex exercise. Um, so from the outside, the ability to affect that, I think, is extremely low. Um, second point, I think what is a great um, concern uh, from the outside is that um, coalition talks might take too long in Germany. Um, I'm not sure how long they actually will, be, uh, will take. Uh, I would not be surprised if you would have a coalition in place already before Christmas, but there is a strong concern that potentially it might take too long. So all those who have been arguing um, who can fill in a potential vacuum now after Merkel and with Germany being uh, dealing with its internal affairs? This was the wrong logic. It's not that uh, external actors, other member states, other heads of state and government in the European Council want to fill uh, any kind of vacuum. They need Berlin to be able to define policy and, uh, decisions, um, and that's what is strongly in their interest. Um, and also from a French perspective, given that they're having the council presidency in the first half of next year, but also the presidential election, they quickly need to have a partner on, on the other side of the Rhine in place for them to also be able to deliver when it comes to their concerns and priorities uh, during the French uh, presidential um, pre council presidency. Um, the, the second point, um, or the third point relates to, um, to Europe and the coalition. I think that, um, as we said earlier, I think the big lines will be clear. You will have a very pro-European government. However, having said that, the devil lies in the detail. And when you look into different areas, and they were mentioned, whether it has to do with economic governance reform, foreign policy, ECB, um, these are all issues where there are strong differences, especially with the FTP, as Kassin has mentioned. They will try to be the gatekeeper gatekeeper trying to prevent certain reforms or, or developments going in the wrong direction. And I think that's also what a good part of their electorate um, assumes that they would do. 
Um, so it will be extremely difficult for them to agree uh, on issues related to European affairs. But Europe in itself, I don't think will be a top priority, but there are a lot of concerns which relate to European affairs, which are also of a national concern. And there, it will be difficult to find agreements, uh, which also leads me to the Green Deal. Uh, yes, you will have the Greens pushing for that. Um, you will also have you know, parts of the SPD pushing for it, uh, but you will have the FDP arguing, uh, well, we first of all have to have in mind what that means for business interests, what that means in terms of the economy, um, how we will actually be able to deliver uh, and, and, and combine what, uh, what was already said, you know, the role of the state and, 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 and liberalism. Um, so on these kind of issues, I think it will be very difficult to form a, a, a joint position and then hold it through over the upcoming years. And I think as time progresses, but that goes for the Green Deal in general, we will see how difficult it is to implement things in practice. And I think you will also see that in Berlin and in the future government, which leads me to my final point, which is who will be running the show in Berlin when it comes to EU affairs in future? Uh, because we've seen over the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years that increasingly uh, it has been the Chancellery which has been assuming the major role when it comes to formulating EU policy. How will that be in future? Uh, when you when the big coalition partner is actually not as big, only 25%, and um, the two others combined being equally strong. And um, so where will the powers lie in future in Berlin when it comes to EU affairs? I think that uh, any chancellor, including now Scholz, or even if Lasha would make it, they will have a strong um, inclination to make sure that the chancellor will be running the show, to put it in simple terms. But it, it still is a question mark with how actually that will work out. Um, and the final point uh, to EU army, uh, I often, when I hear these things, and yes, you find them in party declaration, it often is a fig leaf. Huh? It allows you to say, we are very pro-European, this is our major objective, but when it comes to the concrete details of what it means to get there, then you see, especially when it comes to defense and security, that, that, that from the perspective of Berlin, this is a very tough to, uh, cookie. And it's tough, tough to agree on, to do the things you would have to do in order to actually get closer to what people call yeah. an EU army. So let's be careful with these fig leaves. Mm -hmm. um, Sophia, uh, may I uh, um, bring in another issue that was raised, um, which was more in the foreign policy dimension, but um, how about, would the new coalition have a tougher stance on autocracies, like for example, Serbia? Um, and maybe I can pair that with the rule of law question also within the EU, what do we expect, uh, should we expect uh, with uh, relations to uh, Hungary, Poland, etc.? That's an interesting question. I think um, it actually it's a difficult one to answer and I, I'd be interested to see what Janice and, and Kirsten are saying on that one. Um, I think it was especially the, the CDU that was focusing on dialogue. If you look at the party program, I think none of them had some, you know, new and innovative mechanisms where you, for EU rule of law. Um, so safeguarding values, I think they still, they all agree that it's important to do so. Uh, but when it comes to the implementation, I think there is little ideas. Um, I think especially the CDU and the CSU, because they were in the EPP um, and because Fidesz was part of it, um, it took quite a while. So I think it was a bit more difficult there. But then I, I'm not sure that the Social Democrats will have a much more ambitious stance. I think it really depends. The big issue with rule of law is that, um, as it is with EU policy, it doesn't tend to be one of the most, you know, prioritized issues um, in, in domestic policy. So I think it will, you will have to see over the years how it develops. Um, I think one of the big issues is, of course, that we do not have a great answer at EU level anyway, so it will be difficult. I think that it would be good um, to have uh, a, a more strategic discussion about it with France to see how they could position themselves and how the two bigger countries in the EU could actually have an impact uh, to make sure to safeguard EU values. Um, but I'm not sure that's a priority as such. And I think that's been a big issue with rule of law that it hasn't been on the top of the priority. And therefore, you know, it hasn't been seen as something where you really need to have some kind of strategic discussions about it, but rather continue the stance of saying, yes, we need to have dialogue and yes, we will do a few more infringement procedures. Then I think it also depends on the current news to see whether you will have some uh, new anti-LGBTQI law where you will have a more public pressure on it. When it comes to the Greens, for instance, they had a rather strict line. So I think it will also depend on whether the Greens see this as a priority within the coalition negotiations um, to push through a much more um, ambitious line and say, we're not accepting this. Um, but generally speaking, 
I think it depends on the coalition negotiations. It's hard to say. I hope to see something a little bit more ambitious, but we'll have to see. Uh, Kerstin, uh, your, your take on the rule of law issue, um, also having in mind uh, the clock and that you have to leave yeah. um, in a few minutes. Um, yeah. uh, your thoughts on, on this issue? Yeah, I think it's, good. it's really good that this issue is raised now. Um, uh, in general, I would uh, point out that the relationship uh, to the Eastern Europe countries were very much depending also on Merkel's insight from former years, from her socialization. And she had, uh, even we could not see that all the time in public, but she had in general very good connections to these member states. And uh, I just want to uh, remind you that finally she, she managed that uh, Hungary and Poland agreed on this recovery fund. So I think with Merkel's uh, um, uh, adieu uh, to the chancellery, also the, the relationship between Germany and the Eastern European countries and the relationship that means also between the European Union and these um, Eastern European countries will be on a different, uh, could be could could be on a different take then, and I want to add that um, if Olaf Scholz uh, managed to become the chancellor, I mean we will have a SPD chancellery and a CDU von der Leyen Commission's president. I think also this party change could influence um, European policy and also the relationship and the, the interaction between the chancellery and the European Commission. And uh, so, I, I mean, I, I have to leave unfortunately now, but uh, this I would like to point out that I think also on the Eastern European countries and Germany and the European Commission, there will be a slight change, could be a slight change of policy. I've never seen Scholz, um, especially talking about the rule of law issue. Um, and uh, so I, I was happy enough to uh, to cover him the last three and a half years as finance minister, and I also on all these trips uh, when he went away, and we had a really a uh, lot of uh, background talks. But I cannot remember that we had one about the Eastern European countries and this um, rule of law. I think this is something what they say here, what Merkel once called Neuland. So we will see what they are doing there. Thank you so much. Uh, may, maybe uh, because our time is already up, um, yeah, I can pose uh, uh, one last question and I would ask you to answer it very briefly in uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds. Uh, what do you think um, should be uh, the top priority for the new German government in European affairs? For what should the new government do first in, in terms of European uh -huh. affairs? I think they have to establish uh, that uh, the trust that the new German government will uh, stay uh, the big partner in the European Union, a, a, a dealer, a deal maker, uh, a moderator, and that uh, that it will not happen what uh, uh, the FDP leader Christian Lindner said. Now we all, always took took care about the European interest. Now they have to take care about the German interest. I hope that this sentence is forgotten. Will be forgotten soon. Okay, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I know it's thank you so much for invitation. I, I love to discuss with my old Brussels colleagues. <laughs> Great, thank you so bye. much and bye have bye. a good day. Bye, um, Janis and Sophia. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll start with Sophia and give the final word to Janis. Um, the same question I mean, um, Olaf Scholz uh, said yesterday, and we, uh, we already mentioned he will be most likely to be a new chancellor. He mentioned yesterday that the first topic for German politics will be to form a stronger and more sovereign European Union. Um, but what, does, what will that mean in practice? Um, uh, what will be the most pressing issue that this new government should tackle on, on the European level, Sophie? Yeah, so that's a big question because there's a lot of policy files that need to be tackled. Uh, I think what, uh, what Kerstin said is obviously um, very true, is to establish a very strong relationship to the partners. After 16 years of Merkel, there is, well, there is a gap there. So it's really to build that trust. And I think uh, looking at the timeline as well, because you have European elections coming up in 2024, if I'm correct. So it's really to support also the work program of the commission when it comes to the Green Deal and the digital transformation in particular, to make sure that those policy files are really, you know, supported by Germany and a strong Franco-German alliance to make sure that um, the commission can deliver on its work program. 
Yannis. I'm just adding uh, to what uh, Kathleen and Sophie were saying by taking up the last point uh, which Sophie mentioned, which is the relationship with Paris. I think uh, given also that uh, we will have the French presidency in the first half of next year, there needs to be a quick coordination between uh, the Elysee and the Chancellor, especially with respect to what they consider to be joint points of interest and to agree on certain things. And yes, there are a lot of uh, different, di different files which need to be dealt with in that uh, relationship. But there's one thing which is, which is pressing, which is what we call the Conference on the Future of Europe, um, where the French have been pushing for it, uh, have been very strongly behind it. Um, and Germany now is um, uh, not being able to play a role in that process. And the process is ongoing and it will finish during the French presidency. So you don't have a lot of time so they need to get their act together on how they will use this conference on the future of Europe to come to concrete results and then to implement them in future because uh, what comes out of the conference will not end uh, when the conference will end. So I think an agreement between Paris and Berlin general, but a specific one on issues related to the conference is key. Thank you, Yanis. And uh, thanks both of you for, for your insights uh, to the debate. Unfortunately, our time is already up. Um, there were a lot of questions that we could not answer, unfortunately. Um, a lot of questions about Russia, about uh, the transatlantic relations um, and uh, G7 uh, um, uh, foreign uh, trade policy. Um, but uh, this won't be our last occasion um, we'll, uh, to discuss the, the German elections. Uh, on Friday, we'll have an EPC update. Um, we're also, uh, Yanis and Sophie will be there and we'll partly also cover um, the German elections in, in uh, one half of this meeting. So um, we will make sure to convey all your questions to Jackie who will moderate the discussion and then pick up hopefully on, on some of them. Um, yeah, let me thank again um, both of our speakers, um, of course also Kerstin who already left us and also uh, to everyone um, who uh, yeah, participated today with all your uh, questions. Um, we will return to this topic, and but for now, I'll wish you a very good day and hope to see you um, very soon in the future at other EPC events. Um, have a good day and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.